Texas. And Austin, please join me in welcoming Chairman Gilberto Hinojosa and Chairman Steve Ministeri. Come on up. This Mr. Chairman will put you far. Right, thank you. And I promise we'll make this work, okay? Right there. Good to see you both. You thank sure you both you for being here. You want me to put me on the left? Maybe we it may be the only time that you're on the left, that you're left of Chairman Hinojosa. A joke that is always funny. I appreciate you making it. <laughs> Good not. to have you both here. Thank you very much for joining us. You're welcome. Thank you. So here we sit less than two months from the election. I think I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to know in advance what you're going to say about this, but who's going to win? I want to know from the perspective of the party chairman, first uh, Chairman Ministeri, how do you view the likely outcome of the elections from the Republican Party perspective less than two months out? Uh, before I do that, with all due respect, let me correct something. Okay. The election is really not two months away. The election started last week on September 5th when mail-in ballots could be asked for and sent in. So from our point of view, the voting process already started and now it will go for about two months. A fair point. So yeah. uh, given the fact that the election has already started, Mr. Chairman, <laughs> how do you view the outcome of the election from the perspective of the party? Well, we, we don't take anything for granted. This is a competitive state. It's been a competitive state. It is? Years. Yes, sir. No question. And, uh, can, can you provide me with evidence that it's a competitive state? I'd be happy to. Yeah. In, in 2006, 2008, the bottom of our ticket only did a little over 51% statewide. In right. 2008, the legislature was split 76-74. Believe it or not, in 2008, Mr. Hinojosa's party actually held the majority of the offices of the state. They had about 2,800 to our 2,400, right. although that's now reversed where we now have about 3,300. The Democrats actually held 57% of the offices in 2008. Our ticket in 2008 uh, averaged 52.94%. However, that is reversed. Uh, last time we had about 54% on the bottom of our ticket, 55% two years earlier, and we and on top of our ticket, uh, I'm sorry, our average of our ticket did about 60% in 2000. So from your perspective, the Republican Party is playing defense in this election? Uh, we're always on the offense. But yeah. the, the, the point is that it's a competitive state. People sometimes don't realize that. It's just that we've been winning the competition and yeah. because we, we don't take it for granted and we, we don't take anything for granted this election, but we feel very, very good about but it. You're com but you're confident about the outcome? If the, if the election process ended today, uh, we would win all the statewide offices. Mr. Chairman, are you as, as confident from your side as he is, and do you believe, as he does, that this is a competitive state? Well, you know, Texas is not really a red state. It's a non-voting state, as Paul Bogalis said. I mean, what has happened here in the state of Texas is that uh, for a long time, uh, a big part of the base of the Democratic Party just hasn't been turning out. Um, and that's why we've been losing elections. I mean, if you take the, the, the people that are part of the the allied groups of the Democratic Party, our base, I mean, we have a, uh, probably 65 to 70 percent of the people in the state of Texas are African American, Hispanics, uh, uh, progressive white people, Asians, um, the LGBT community, women who are really angry at what the Republican Party is doing to them in their war against women. All these groups make up a large percentage, a large majority of the people in, this, in the state of Texas. But a big part of that group, which are Hispanics, hasn't been turning out. And so our challenge in this election is to do that. Um, if you look at it from a, a David and Goliath perspective, um, we're the David, they're the Goliath in, in terms of their ability to win elections because of the money that they have, right. the fact that they have all the statewide office holders. But, but remember that fight, um, David won that fight against Goliath because he used uh, tactics, I think, that worked for him right. under the circumstances. David our, only had to turn himself out to vote, though. Well, and that's the issue here. That is how we win this election, by focusing on our base. For the longest period of time, the Texas Democratic Party, um, I think, didn't pay the attention on the, to the base that it needed to uh, pay, needed uh, to work on. And what happened for, you know, 25 years, and I've been involved in Democratic Party politics for, 20, for a lot longer than 25 years. I, I campaigned alongside of Ann Richards in 1990 when she was running for governor. And for the longest period of time, we felt that, well, we can get back these moderate Republicans that left the party immediately and focus on, on them. And yep. we ignored you know, that part of the base that was reliable for Democrats, which were Hispanics, and which would vote for Democrats when you got them to the polls. And what we've been doing in the last you know, year and a half has been focusing on that, uh, on that part of our base that has been underperforming. Yep. And you know, uh, whether we achieve that, and I think that we will, um, will determine whether or not we win this election. Do, do, you, do you put the chances of any of your statewide candidates uh, winning in November at, at better than 50 percent? I do. I do, and, I, and let me tell you why. 
Uh, there's a f several factors that have come into play. This is not the same Republican Party as yesterday. This Republican Party is totally out of touch with mainstream Texans today. Their positions on issues that affect Texans all over the great, the great state um, is so far to the right. They have completely been uh, overtaken by the, Repu by the Tea Party in the state. The position that they take, for example, you know, their reparative therapy position and their platform, um, their anti-education, their anti-women positions, I think have, has turned out a lot of people in this state who has historically voted for uh, Republicans. On top of all of that, uh, I think this is not the Democratic Party of, of yesterday. This Democratic Party that we have today is a pro-business party. If you can believe uh, th that statement being made out of the Democratic Party in the year 2014, we are the pro-business party. Business community is looking at us as a party that gives the opportunity to business to grow because we believe that a strong public education, opportunities in higher education, making sure that yep. we have an infrastructure in terms of roads and bridges and water adequately funded in the state, they understand that that's what's going to make the state move forward. I was listening to NPR the other day, just a couple of days ago, and one of the reasons why most economists believe that um, the economy is not growing at the pace that it needs to be growing is because the United States has not made the investment in education that it made in, in prior generations. And that has always determined whether or not you will have continued sustained growth in America. And here in the, in the state of Texas, we're 49th out of 50 in funding per child. And that's one of the reasons why the business community is, 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 is having a serious problem with some of the candidates that the Republicans are running. And then on top of that, yeah. we're much better organized. Mm -hmm. We work in the field much better than we have before. We have, I started this, this uh, organization with four people working on staff. I have 112 people working so you, on So you've grown your efforts to reach out to people, and you've actually answered my next question, which was why you and not them? You know, what is the argument, the intellectual framework for the case you're putting before voters between now and November? And it sounds to me that there's both a negative case against the Republicans and a positive case for yourselves. Obviously, Chairman Munisteri, you have a positive case for your own party, and I suspect a negative case for the Democrats. So he's answered why them and not you. You answer why you and not them. Well, we have a positive message for Texas. Uh, I don't know if you followed it, but a couple of months ago, we got fantastic news that the gross domestic product numbers for the state of Texas were revised upward. So that in 2012, this state grew at 7.8%. And last year, grew at 3.8% when the national economy is going between 1.5% and 2%. Yep. For the first nine months of this year, the national economy grew at 1.67%. So when you're looking at 7.6% growth rates, that's amazing. Here in Austin, unemployment rate 3.8. Houston, 4.2. The national average, a point down. We've absorbed 800,000 new job holders from other states between 2000 and 2000. And you attribute that to Republican policies? Well, absolutely. Look at, look at the, the comparison between California and Texas. Uh, between 2000 and 2010, our economy grew at 93%. Uh, their economy grew in the 70%. So we're about a quarter percent uh, or 25% higher, roughly, in gross domestic product growth. But let me, yeah. let me finish. Yeah. So you look at those states. The demographic makeup is about the same. They have the same type of resources. They have oil and gas. Right. They have, and, and what is the difference? Uh, they're roughly 25% higher tax burden. We are the third lowest per capita tax burden, third lowest spending per capita, and people are voting with their feet. I mean, we're, we're having a huge influx, whereas the number of people, for example, in California between 2000 and 2010 that actually moved out of the state was greater than the number of people. So it's an economic people. argument primarily that you're making, that the party is making to voters. It's not just an economic argument. We ask people, are they enjoying uh, their life in Texas? Right. Do they go around Houston, go around Austin, do you see building cranes? Do you enjoy the amenities? Do you think this is a great state? Yep. And as I say, people have been voting um, with their feet. And I'll point out something else. We do an analysis of voters into the state. California, the number of people coming here are 1.5 Republicans to one uh, Democrat. So these movers into the state are making the state more Republican. More Republican. Chairman Hinojosa says that your party is anti-women, that your party is anti-business, which I think is an interesting spin on what one might expect. Uh, he says that the Republican Party is out of touch with the state. I'm, I'm, I'm hearing you yeah. not, well, let, not agree with him. Well, let's take women. The latest yeah. Wilson Perkins poll shows that General Abbott is leading among women. Uh, the UT poll that I think you were partners with, um, it asked people whether they were very conservative, lean conservative, et cetera. Yeah. Forty-eight percent were to the right of center. Only 20 percent were to the left of center. 
So by your own poll, 80% of Texans are center-right, only 20% of Texans consider themselves liberal. The Wilson Perkins poll of December 2012, which was only of Hispanic voters, 40% of Hispanic voters in the state of Texas considered themselves conservative. Only 18% of Hispanic voters consider themselves liberal. There was a study February 9, 2014 from Gallup this year which showed that Chairman Hinojosa's party has lost dramatic support among Hispanics in Texas. It showed that over a five-year period of time, the number of Hispanics in Texas that consider themselves Democratic have actually declined from 53% to 46%. Yep. So the more they're working the Hispanic community, the more they're falling. That James poll showed that we have been increasing. Uh, chairman, I want to ask you to ask you to address that because obviously you've alluded to it. I think the chairman has confronted it head on. The question of whether uh, you can count on A, turning out the Latino vote, and B, whether the Latinos who turn out will necessarily be with you and not with them. What about that? Well, I don't think there's any question that when, the, when you've looked at the track record of Hispanics in the state of Texas, first of all, if you look at the total number of elected officials that, are, that, that will be designated by party, we have 90% of them uh, that are, that are 90 percent of the Latinos in the state of Texas that run by political party are Democrats. Right. Less than 10 percent actually are Republicans. Secondly, nobody's ever said that, that Hispanics uh, do not have conservative family values that they, that they live their lives by. Small C conservative. Yeah, well, they, they do. But when it comes to voting, they understand who's on their side and who's not on their side. Right. When they voted this last election in 2012, better than 70 percent of them voted for Barack Obama in the this, in this state. Right. You know, when, when, they, when they vote on issues that affect their, their, their lives, the issues that are important to them, the issues with respect to education, with respect to health care, with, with respect to jobs, they vote for Democrats uniformly, and that doesn't include the fact that there's a huge number of them that are not, that are that not, are not participating. Voting. But, but let, me, yeah. let me add one more thing. I don't think that the Republican Party should take credit for um, the economy in the state of Texas. That economy is where it's at because of the strong work that, um, has, that working people in the state of Texas have been involved in over the years. Um, if, if, if the Republican Party wants to take credit for um, the economic growth in this state, then can Barack Obama take credit for the fact that we're out of this recession that they put us in? They're never going to give him credit for that, yet they want to take credit for the economic situation that exists in the state. We are where we're at today because people in this state work every day hard to support their families, not because of whatever the Republican Party has done. And on top of all of that, a lot of the things that they have done have hurt the, eco the economy, or they attempted to hurt the, the economy when, ev like, when every single Congress Republican congressmen in the state of Texas voted to shut down the government. The losses to the to the to the federal budget as a result of that were in the billions, uh, and it affected our growth during that period of time. They cannot take credit for where we're at to, uh, today any more than they can deny that Barack Obama can take credit for pulling us out of the uh, econo economic situation that they left us in when he took over. Let me let me let me come back, Chairman. Let me, let me stay with the Latino question just for a second because I know we came back to the business stuff, but I want to stay with this because this is really a crucial focus of both parties in this election cycle. The reality is, Mr. Chairman, George W. Bush used to routinely get 40 percent or more of the Latino vote when he ran. It is not outside the realm of possibility that a Republican candidate would get a significant share of the Latino vote. The question is whether these Republican candidates can get those votes. Is, does Greg Abbott have the appeal that George W. And, Bush had? That's the problem that they've got right, right now. I mean, look, I just, on my way over here, I was listening to NPR, and they talked about what Ted Cruz did yesterday. He attached a rider to the budget reauthorization, a temporary reauthorization, right. that said that, um, that it was contingent upon passing uh, a, a law that, uh, that repealed the, the president's Deferred, deferred deportation program for the dreamers, the young uh, 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 immigrants who came into this country through no fault of their own and ended up in this country and have lived here all their lives and speak English sometimes as their main language yep. and are going, going to, to, to school and are, 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 are enrolled in, enrolling in college or have gone to the military. This is a law that if you pull most, most Americans, most Texans in fact, they think that's a good thing. You shouldn't punish these immigrant children as a result of what their children did by bringing them here, their parents did it by bringing them here illegally. 
Yet, the United States Senator is willing, uh, for the state of Texas, Ted Cruz, is willing to shut down the government so that we can take away the, uh, uh, this administrative regulation by uh, President Obama and deport these children. Now, how do you expect Hispanic families in the, in the state of Texas are going to react to that? Their positions on immigration reform, their refusal to pass immigration ref reform, every single United States congressman in the state of Texas that's a Republican and, and the two Republican United States senators voted against the DREAM Act when it was proposed by President Barack Obama two years ago. If you look at their position recently, when, when they, took, they took a stand on the immigrant children, that were, the migrant children that were coming into South Texas, who were fleeing from torture, who were refugees, which was a humanitarian crisis, every single one of those individuals signed off on a piece of legislation that was passed in the House of Representatives to, to force the administration to deport all these children immediately. These are children who were being murdered and whose families brought them over here because other children were being mur murdered and tortured in Honduras and other C Central American countries that, uh, that, that the lawlessness has taken over. So if that's what they're doing, and then you add to that, you know, the first year, the first year that Hispanic children became the majority of school children in the state of Texas, what do they do? What do they do? They cut the budget for uh, public education by $5.4 billion, decimating our public education system, increasing uh, uh, student-teacher ratios, making it more difficult for, for teachers to be able to teach because of these larger uh, sizes, uh, allowing tons of, of teachers and, 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 and administrators to be laid off as a result of that. Right. All these anti-Hispanic policies are creating serious problems. Well, let, well, let's give the chairman the opportunity yeah. to respond to that. I mean, obviously, you've heard this, that well, the party on the one hand says it wants outreach, and you have actually, as in your time as chairman, have led an outreach effort, right? And the chairman made numerous points. Yeah, so please, please address those. Address one yes. One. First of all, there's no credible poll that shows that the Democrats get 70% of Latino votes, as the chairman suggested. I will cite you two polls. The Univision gave us a briefing as other uh, political organizations about two months ago. In the Univision poll, uh, Greg Abbott was only eight points behind Wendy Davis among Hispanics. Uh, in the Wilson Perkins poll last week, Greg Abbott had actually pulled ahead among Hispanics. Uh, George Bush, you mentioned, had 40%. That's not correct. CNN exit polls in 2000, 2004, both the gubernatorial and the presidential race in Texas, 49%. And there were times when Kay Bailey Hutchison pulled over 50%. Currently, we are doing very well among Hispanics. Ted Cruz, according to Wilson Perkins poll December right. 2012, had 41% of the Hispanic vote. That's one of the reasons we're winning. I'll also point out that their candidate, Wendy Davis, lost 21% of her primary vote against a no-name, no-funded candidate. Almost all the counties that she lost, and I believe the number was 16 majority Hispanic counties or Hispanic counties, they are losing the Hispanic vote. Well, in fact, she only got 54% of the vote. I looked up this morning and Chairman uh, uh, Hinojosa's own county, right. so Cameron, Cameron County. Yourself, why is she yeah. doing so poorly? Well, the Wilson Perkins poll, for example, showed that by about two to one, uh, Hispanic voters in Texas are solidly pro-life, and the Democrats have nominated a candidate whose chief issue is allowing late-term abortions. So among Hispanic voters, we're doing uh, exceptionally well. And as I, Chairman Harris, Is that really, I mean, uh, Chairman, let me, let me stop you. Is that really a fair characterization of Senator Davis's campaign? Her chief issue is that she wants late-term abortions? Well, I would say the, the reason she had national exposure, does anybody think that the reason she's on the national scene is any reason other than she had a filibuster last June? That that's the reason her star rose. So I would ask you, what was that filibuster about? So among Hispanics, the Democratic Party chairman didn't address why has his party, according to Gallup this year, had a significant decrease among Hispanic voters. That same Gallup poll showed that the Texas GOP beat the other 49 states in the GOP by six percentage points. And while the National Party was declining, the Texas GOP has actually been going up. Right. So we've been doing very well in the Hispanic community. Now, the chairman also raised another point that I want to address. He says we don't give President Obama credit for the economy. We 100% give him credit for the one and a half to two percent growth rates when the national average since World War II is 3.3 percent. That normally when you come off a recession you have five, six, seven percent growth rates. Go back and look at the Reagan years when during the, the last two years of his first term 
you're seeing in individual months six, seven percent growth rates. When there was a month where he created over a million jobs. So we do give him credit for a very slow growth rate. Now this morning NBC had a poll. And in that poll, the approval rating for President Obama was 40%. 14% more people disapprove of Obamacare than approve. So when they say that we're you're only too happy to have the president yes, be front and we center. Want, yeah. We want him to get credit. What, what about so the point that, that you, what about the point the chairman made about about children of undocumented persons, the Dream well, Act, and 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 let me even roll that forward to the next legislative session. You know, the the tension for a lot of people on the Republican Party and Latinos is, you know, there's an effort to make outreach, you know, to to the Latino community to try to attract more votes, but then legislation and rhetoric tends to run smack into that. On the question of the Dreamers, and on the question, let's just say specifically of in-state tuition for the children of undocumented people. This is an issue that's likely to come back up in right. the session. Can the party on the one hand say, we want to attract more Latino voters, but on the other hand, given some of the rhetoric of some candidates, not everybody, and some legislation that's been floated, can you really say that you're not running smack into your best, your no, be, I mean, best intention? Well, let, let, well please, let, 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 the, let the chairman, let, let, chairman, let the chairman yeah. address that question. Right. Can, you know, can, you, can you do that? Chairman, and I, was, I, yeah. I was very quiet. When, I listen to your monologue. Do, do, you, do, you, do, you have, do you have a problem? Do you have a problem in the party on the one hand with your intentions and on the other hand with rhetoric and some legislation maybe thwarting your best efforts? The final proof is are we increasing our support among Hispanic voters? I don't presume to know what Hispanic voters have as their number one issues. Yep. I let them tell us through the ballot box. When we put out our positions, we have been increasing our percentage. Let, let me give you something, and I know this is sponsored by A&M, so I'll go slow on the math there. Ooh. We have, <laughs> we, 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 the- You just may have won the Aggie vote, actually. On the, the, the percentage of Anglo voters in the state has been declining rapidly, from 75% to 68%. Indeed. Toil, 68% to 63%. Yes. The percentage of the Republican Party's Anglo vote that we're getting has not been increasing. However, we've been increasing our margins of victory. For example, in 2012, Obama lost by 16 points in the state, and he lost by only 14 points in 2008. There is only one mathematical explanation if our percentage of the Anglo voters is staying the same, and yet Anglo voters are becoming a small. You must be getting more non-Anglo voters. That's exactly what's occurring. Well, Chairman. Let, well, look, let's get something straight. I think that everybody in this room will tell you, and every person that's viewing uh, this program today will tell you, will agree with me, that George W. Bush, if he ran for office in the state of Texas today in a Republican primary, espousing the positions that he, that he took, on immigration reform when he was uh, president of the United States would lose a primary Might election. Might have a hard time getting out he of He would primary. have a hard time winning an election. Kay Bailey Hutchinson, who was a conservative in this state, lost her primary against uh, Rick Perry. You know, this last election, Dewhurst, who was a conservative, simply because he had supported uh, in-state tuition, lost a primary against a right-wing Republican by the name of Dan Patrick. This is not of the Republican Party of yesterday that uh, polled well with, with Hispanics in the state of Texas. Uh, and how do, you, how do you go to Hispanics in the state of Texas and say, we want you to vote for us because we want to cut public education for your children. We want to make it virtually impossible for your children to be able to go to college. And you know what, on top of that, we're cheering because they're trying to eliminate the Affordable Care Act, even though Texas, uh, Texas has more uninsured persons uh, than any other state in the country in this state, most of which are Hispanic. And on top of all of that, we want you to vote for us because Rick Perry is not willing to accept $100 billion over the next 10 years of expanded Medicaid coverage, most of which would be used to include uh, Hispanics uh, uh, under health care in, uh, in the state of Texas. These are the kinds of issues. And that so that's the case, and that's the that, case you that is, their, that is the issue that they're coming to Hispanics and they're saying, vote for us. You know what? The word Hispanic doesn't mean stupid, all right? They get it. They understand what's important for their families. They understand that, that we're not going to make it in this country unless we have a good quality education. When you cut public education, they're not willing to grow education in the state of Texas to keep up with, with uh, funding, to keep up with student enrollment, most, most of which is Hispanic, 
Uh, you're leaving Hispanics with a, a situation where they can get out of the cycle of poverty that many of them face today. They're not going to like that. Our, our role, our role yeah. as a Democratic Party, is to make sure that people understand that when they go out and vote, they're voting for their families, and that's the work that we have to undertake. Chairman, let me pivot this conversation. We could talk about this, obviously, for two hours, three hours, but let me pivot well, this conversation. Well, we know why that we all could. Let me pivot this conversation over to a question about your party and the tension that many of us assume exists between the traditional wing of the Republican Party, the business wing on the one hand, Chairman Hinojosa alluded to that to some degree, and the Tea Party. There are people who believe now that the old Republican Party has be been essentially absorbed into the Tea Party and that um, the Tea Party now is essentially driving the agenda of, of the Texas Republican Party to the point that possibly some moderate Republicans would be persuadable on some, on some of the issues that the chairman refers to. Have we outside the party overblown this? Are we overblowing this? There's not really a tension inside the party after all. Well, those are two different questions. The first is, have you overblown it? Yes. The second is, is there tension within the party? The answer to that is yes. But there's always tensions in political parties. There's tensions in the Democratic Party. All you have to do is watch their Democratic convention. I, I've been at this for 42 years. Yeah. There are always factions in parties. Now, let's take Tea Party endorsed candidates. Yeah. Byron Cook wasn't a Tea Party endorsed candidate. Sarah Davis wasn't a Tea Party endorsed <coughs> candidate. Jim Keffer wasn't a, a, a Tea Party endorsed candidate. I can go on and on. It's, it's mixed results in the factions in our party, which right. is always the case. But look at our state convention. I have been unopposed for two times. Uh, how would that happen unless the factions of a party put aside their differences and come together? How is it we're winning by overwhelming margins? Right. There are people on the outside like to say that the divisions in the party are causing us problems, but the truth of the matter is we put aside our differences and we focus on beating the Democrats because everybody in our party understands that the differences between the factions in our party are somewhat smaller than the gulf between even our most moderate members of the Democratic Party. Uh, Mr. Mr. Chairman, on, on your side of the equation, you mentioned the president. Um, and you actually have said kind things about the president's record. And you've actually, it sounds to me like you embraced the president and the, pre and the president's record. You know that uh, for the president, uh, pardon me, for a lot of Texas Democrats, the president could be a millstone around, around their necks. There are a lot of Texas Democrats who would rather run from Washington, D.C., from the National Democratic Party, because they feel like it presents an unflattering comparison when, when they're running in elections that are hard to win without that. They think that makes it actually harder for them to, to win. Is there a tension in your party as well between the National Democratic Party and the Texas Party, the Obama end of the party, and some more conservative Democrats who possibly want to try to win by running you, to the center? If, if you look at, if anybody took a look at our convention uh, that we had uh, at the end of June, uh, you can see that we're completely united. Um, we didn't have floor fights on the platform yep. like they had in the Republican Party. Um, on every single issue uh, that was of importance to Texas families, we were united. Yep. Whether it was on, on, on the economy, whether it was on public education, higher education, on uh, uh, women's health care issues, on every single issue, on the issue of, of, uh, of, of marriage equality, the Texas Democratic Party was united. There was, and it's not that anybody was enforcing, uh, uh, making sure that people were uh, marching lockstep with what the leadership wanted. Everybody was together. This was organic. This is organic. People right. believe uh, in what uh, we uh, have defined as the values of the Texas Democratic Party from all spectrums of the Democratic Party, all ethnic groups, men and women. Uh, I think that the platform reflects what we believe in as Democrats in the great state. So contrary to what Ms., uh, the chairman for the Republican Party stated, we were united. You, you looked at the Republican convention, um, it, I would have a difficult time saying that that means that they're united when they're getting into huge fights on the issue of immigration reform. I mean, they have taken positions that are totally, out, totally outside the mainstream on issues like immigration reform, marriage equality, this reparative therapy. So theory. you stand by, you feel comfortable, uh, Chairman, with the platform that came out of your state convention this year. You stand behind it 100%. That's right. I, Do you I, stand behind yours 100%, Mr. Chairman? I never agree with any platform 100%. I've never found a single person I agree with 100%, even myself, because I sometimes change my mind. But if somebody wants to understand what the Republican Party stands for, wants to decide whether they believe that they're in sync with the values of the party, wouldn't the party platform be a place that they would go to see what does this party believe? Well, you, People need to understand what a platform is and it is not. Uh, we have millions of Republicans. The platform may or may not 
represent what a what the majority of millions of Republicans agree. So what's well, the point of having a platform? I was about to tell you. Yeah, yeah. Uh, a platform is an indication of what the activist base and majority of them believe, in whether they can take a document as a whole. And it doesn't even mean that they agree with any particular plank, because you have to right. accept the platform in a whole or the entire thing's rejected. Right. Th but th this actually begs the question of, of why we even need parties to begin with. You know, what you've just said is that the pr platform document reflects what the activist members of the party believe. In reality, in both, in both cases, in the case of the Republican Party and the case of the Democratic Party, it does seem as if the activists are the ones who turn out at these conventions. The activists are the ones who have an involvement with the platform. The activists we know are the ones who vote in these very low turnout primaries. It seems like the activists are in charge. In some ways, I'm wondering if I wanted the heads of the Republican and Democratic parties of Texas to be up here on stage with me, why I didn't invite Michael Quinn Sullivan and Jeremy Byrd. I mean, the, the reality is I wonder if the institutional parties, the Republican Party and the Democratic Party, are actually less relevant than, than ever before in terms of how, no, how this actually plays out. Chairman. And I'll even speak for the, the chairman and correct me if I'm wrong. I think the Texas Democratic Party is absolutely essential. I think the Texas Republican Party is absolutely essential. The Texas Democratic Party are doing things that no other organization will do. They're working on their get out the vote. They're working on their door to door. That's what the Republican Party does. Both of our structures are absolutely necessary to ensure that we turn out uh, people to support both our tickets. But given the voter turnout in the state stinks, aren't you both no, no, failing? No, no, well, no, no, it doesn't stink for Republicans. It just stinks for Democrats. <laughs> oh, I think it's, oh, oh, Mr. Chairman, excuse no, no, me. No. It stinks for no, Republicans. No, hold, on hold on a second. Yeah. Our turnout in 2012 was higher for Republican votes than in 2008. It was the, check it, the Democratic turnout for Obama in raw numbers was less than it was in 2008. Did I not, re did I not read that there were 13.6, I'm gonna just pluck these numbers out. Ross is usually my person who corrects me on this stuff. He'll correct me later, but 13.6 million registered voters in the state of Texas, fewer than two million turned out in the primary in total. We, we're, that doesn't seem I, like 15% is I, not success. I think that we're either 46 or 48% in turnout. We I were 51st in 2010, we're 48th in 2012. 2012. That doesn't sound like the parties and, are rocking and rolling on turnout. And there's no question that the turnout is, is a real big problem uh, in this state, and, and it is a non-voting voting state for all practical purposes. But let me just tell you something about when you talk about the relevance of the party and how it defines what you do for purposes of elections and electing in individuals. You know, when you talk about the platform, I disagree with uh, uh, the chairman of the Republican Party. Our platform really is something that guides um, our elected officials and the policies that they advocate when they get elected uh, to government. Let me tell you something. The Republican Party, uh, I can't remember what the number was, it was about 50 of them wrote an amicus brief on the issue of same-sex marriage. And, and these were legislators, 50 or so legislators wrote an amicus brief that said that if you allow same-sex marriage um, uh, in, uh, in the state of Texas, uh, then the next step is you're going to uh, uh, legalize a pedophile. I think it was actually, I think it was more than 60 actually. Or, right, yeah. more than 60. Yeah. Thank you for correcting me on that. These are the elected leaders of this party. They're taking a position that they're equivocate, they're making, they're uh, comparing same-sex marriage, which a majority of Texans support, um, with um, pedophilia. This is the kind of leadership that is representing the Republican Party in the state of Texas today. They have it in their plan. You think, you think something like that, a reparative therapy for, for members of the LGBT community, something as bizarre as that would ever make it into a party platform of the Democratic Party? Well, Mr. Well, Chairman, you, 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 know. you, you distanced yourself from that particular aspect of the platform, did you not? Yeah, I just don't agree with it. It was my, it's my predecessor's plank, and I'll point out yeah, that yeah. I, I beat her in the land. Right, right. Uh, but, but uh, on the voter, uh, let me let me stay with the voter turnout question. So we obviously have an opportunity in this state. In yeah, this, in can I add something on voter turnout? If, if, sure. If you know in advance of a football game that it's going to be a lopsided landslide, right, win by one team or the other, your attendance goes down. One of the reasons why overall turnout is down is because the Democratic Party has not been competitive. And then when you look at primary turnouts, yep. this is a Democratic Party, 2.8 million in 2008, a little over 700,000 in 2010, a little under 600,000 in 2012, only 550,000 this time with only, I think, 440,000 voting for Davis, and the runoff only had 202,000. But on the Republican side, we're getting good turnouts. We had 1.33 million. 
in our runoff for Senate right. two years ago, we had 1.1 million. That's five times what the Democrats. So the problem is not Republican voters turning out. The problem is people don't vote to turn out the Democrats because it, they don't like their policies. Mr. Well, Chairman, not, isn't Mr. Chairman isn't redistricting also in part a disincentive for people to turn out to well, vote? The fact the fact is we have 240 or so elections on the ballot this November. There are fewer than the fingers on two hands worth of elections in which we do not, as we sit here today, already know the outcome. Doesn't that naturally depress turnout as well? Why would people turn out to vote for elections that are already over? On, on, on the local level, but the presidency of the United States is arguably the most important position in the world. Republicans turned out in greater numbers to vote for Romney in raw numbers in 2012 and 2008, but Democrats turned out less people for Obama. Look, one thing I'm going to one one thing I'm going to agree with uh, uh, the chairman of the Republican Party is that he's right. The turnout for the Democratic Party isn't what it's supposed to be. If our base turned out, we'd be winning elections hand down. You think there are enough Demo people disposition oh, whose disposition there's, is Democratic? There's no, there's no question. I, I don't remember exactly the numbers on that. There is two million, uh, I believe, Hispanics in the state of Texas that are. U.S. citizens over the age of 18 that are not registered to vote. Another 1.5 who are registered that don't go out and vote. That's so what, so, what, so why don't you, you, you sound like Tony Sanchez telling me back in 01 how the mathematics could not work for Rick Perry to be elected. Well, but it, we know what happened. How come you can't well, solve it, that problem? It is a difficult, it is a difficult thing to do overnight. It, it is no silver bullet. All it takes is a lot of hard work that requires an enormous amount of resources spent on the ground talking to people, engaging them, making sure that they understand the importance of elections. But you have to understand that with, with respect to Hispanics, and if you compare that to African Americans who are voting at large percentages uh, here in Texas and all across America today, there was a 60-year history of a voting rights uh, movement that centered around the issue of voting rights. I mean, a uh, uh, civil rights movement that centered around the issue of voting rights. You know, Martin Luther King right. and all his, uh, the civil rights leaders during that period of time understood that the only way you could get civil rights in America was at the, polling, at the voting booth. And they got people registered early on. They taught them how to vote, and they got them there. That same uh, phenomenon did not happen with Hispanics in Texas. The only place it ever happened was in California with yep. the UFW, which was a labor movement, but it was also a civil rights movement. And that's what and why you see uh, California today. So you think, you think it's a marathon and not a sprint in terms well, of I, getting I, the turnout? Well, what we believe in is it's, it's something that you have to focus on. You have to make it as a priority in the state. And, and, and I think the Republicans understand that. They you, get you, it. That's you agree they, that that's, they, a, that's they, a priority? Well, let me just tell you yeah. why. They, I'll tell you why. That's what the voter ID bill is all about. They understand that at some point, we're going to be able to engage this community, get them out to vote, and they want to make it as difficult as they can. You're to suggesting get them out to that vote. the voter ID bill is a deliberate attempt by the Republicans? There's no, as a three judge district court in, in, in D.C. that made that determination. Right. The same thing is by their, their redistricting plan. They have a, we, we gained enough, I believe, for four new congressional seats in the state of Texas in the last census, primarily as a result of Hispanic growth in this, in this state. Yet, when they redistricted, they left us basically with one congressional district out of that whole bunch. You know, they're, all their, their efforts on the, in the issue of, of voter I want to let him, I want to let him have, answer that. ...have been centered around suppressing the vote of Hispanic well, voters. Well, what, what, address, what about that? Let me address his premise, yeah. which is that if they register more Hispanic voters, that that will help the Democratic Party. If, on the other hand, Greg Abbott gets more Hispanic voters voting for him than Wendy Davis, the registration and turnout of Hispanic voters actually helps. The Will have helped the Republicans, right. Now, the last Wilson Perkins polls showed last week showed that Greg Abbott had pulled ahead of Wendy Davis among Hispanic voters. If you go two months ago to the Univision poll that I talked about, it's, it was an 8% difference. So right. say you have an 8% difference that we lose, 56-44. Right. That's not going to be a game changer in terms of turning out more Hispanic voters. We are very confident that we will be at least north of 40 percent among <clears throat> Hispanic voters, and I think we have an outside chance yeah. of winning 50 percent. So I'm yeah. in favor would, of would, registering as many Hispanic so voters. You, so you would agree that as a principle, as a matter of principle, the Republican Party is for registering more vo voters rather than fewer? Absolutely. Okay, so the chairman yesterday, and I know there was no coincidence of timing <laughs> to this, that a press release went out yesterday late in the day right before we were going to sit here together, so I might ask about it. The chairman has challenged you to support him in an effort to get as many young people, college students, registered to vote in this election. Will you join him in that? Yeah, all you have to do is pick up the phone and call me. We don't have to put out press releases. So when he sent a 
email to me from his press officer as opposed to him last night at yeah. 7 53 p.m i responded immediately that i think it's a great idea to register high schoolers and we have done across yeah. the state and we're going to in fact get our youth director involved but you don't need to send a letter out all we have to do is call the secretary of state together and find out what they're doing a, 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 it's a perfect place a, a rare moment of agreement i want to stop there i want i i want to i want to take i want to take a selfie of the three of us actually in a, in a moment of some harmony because that's the way i'll, I'll look back on this conversation and let me ask him one more question if you'll if you'll agree with me in the last next legislative session let's on let's agree to have online voter registration for all voters in the state of Texas. We, we tried to pass a bill in the Democratic Party last legislative session. It was killed by the Republicans on the committee. I want to make sure that both the Democratic chair and the, the Republican chair agree that Texas should have online voter registration. Yes or no? One word answer. I'm not authorized without talking to the board. Got it. Okay. But you were authorized to sign up young people though, right? Oh, yeah. Okay. That's good. All right. Just, 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 just checking. Okay. So to review, young people, we're, yes, we're, online, we're, can't say. Republicans, you know, we're, we're in favor. Let's, uh, let's have questions from the audience. Um, I feel obligated to point out that the vice chairman of the Travis County Republican Party, posing as a citizen, is going to ask you a question. You, if, if the question is, Mr. Ministeri, why are you so awesome? I'm going to remove the microphone from your hand. So let's uh, let Mr. Makoviak ask his question. Sir. I'll resist the urge to ask a partisan question of Chairman Hinojosa, but ask him this. There's a 60% threshold in the United States Senate to, to break a filibuster. Do you believe that threshold uh, would be appropriate in Texas? You know that the two-thirds rule has been under assault by uh, candidates for lieutenant governor back to when the incumbent was still an active candidate. Right. Senator Patrick is on the record saying he believes that the two-thirds rule should go down to 60%, which would mean 19 as opposed to 21, a break in the tradition of modern, uh, the modern Texas Senate. What do you think about that? I think the two-thirds rule has been in effect for generations. It has worked for Texas. It allows government. You know, the, the Texas Senate, when I was growing up in Texas politics, was a united body where Republicans and Democrats worked together to get legislation passed. When you were growing, Texas. come on, when you were growing up in Texas, there were no Republicans yeah, in the Texas well, Senate. No, there was. There was. And I worked with them. I was in the Texas Board of Criminal Justice. I worked with a lot of Republicans in making sure that our prison policies were policies that, that made sure that the public was protected and rehabilitated those offenders that could be rehabilitated. So I understand what it means to work with Republicans, and I have done that very much in, in the past. But at the same time, I understand also that um, in order for you to be able to ensure that, that the minorities' rights are protected in the Texas Senate, um, you should have the two-thirds rule because as a result of that, and I'm not sure a lot of Republicans don't agree with that because it allows them to take cover sometimes on legislation that they really, really don't want to uh, but, vote but, for. Mr. Chairman, is, but isn't, I mean, I'm sorry to have to agree with Mr. Makoviak publicly, but isn't he right about this? If that's the case, why don't you write a letter to Harry Reid telling him that the decision to take the filibuster rule down from 60 to a simple majority was also unfair to the minority? Well, but that's a different, that, that was a different issue that Harry Reid came, uh, was, was, was uh, taking the, uh, 60, the two-thirds rule out. He was, it, what was happening was that the Republicans were blocking virtually all the judicial appointments that were being submitted by President Obama, making it difficult for him to fill a lot of critical uh, seats in, uh, in the judiciary, both in uh, U.S. district courts and in, in appellate courts, simply because of uh, pure politics. I mean, he is the president of the United States. He has a right to appoint those people that he believes are fit to serve in that in those offices. The Republicans, just because they hate Barack Obama, were preventing him from doing that. And Harry Reid just got tired of that. He said, right. but he didn't doesn't do it with other cabinet positions, and right. he doesn't do it with the Supreme Court. Mr. Chairman, you right now have 19 members of the Texas. Senate and the Republican Party. Let's assume Connie Burton wins what is a majority Republican district by voting history, despite the fact that Wendy Davis had won it twice. And so you have now 20 Republicans, 11 Democrats. If the two-thirds rule, which was 21, goes down to 19, why should the Democrats even come to work? Oh, they right? They, 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 they can't accomplish anything on their own. They can't prevent anything on their own. How do you pro protect the minority party in the Senate? And beyond that, how do you govern the state as a st how do you govern a state of all Texans as opposed to simply governing for Republicans? How do you protect people who are not with you? Well, it's not the Republican Party's job to protect the Democratic 
constituents. But don't you represent Democrats in all 31 of those Senate districts? Not, not the state chair of the Republican Party. My constituency is only Republican. I, I, that's the big problem that we've got here. He, uh, the chairman of the Republican Party just put it exactly the way it is. He said, it's not the Republican job, Republican job to protect Democrats. That's not the way you should look at this. It's the Republican senator's job and the Republican legislator's job to work together with Democrats and all individuals that are in government to try to, to enact policies that are good for all Texans. And that's been the problem with this legislature in recent times and with the Republican Party. They don't define their positions based upon what's good for all Texans. So you're they telling define me the positions on what's good for the Tea Party based and controls it, the So if the shoe was on the, the problem, other foot, you wouldn't be trying to stick it to his party if you had the power to stick it to his we party? We didn't do it. We didn't do it. And, you, we and, you, and you wouldn't do it. We didn't do it when we were in control of the Texas Senate, and we wouldn't do it now. We think that what we have to do as, as legislators and, and people in government is to work for all the people, and if a Republican has a great idea, then we're going to embrace it. There are issues that I think that, that, that we can all work together on without you know, seeing what you have today, which is the, the gridlock in Congress, where nothing can come out of the House of Representatives because the Tea Party controls that. And most of those, every single, virtually every single United States congressman that's a Republican in Texas is a Tea Party Republican, and they're part of that little coalition that is blocking things from happening in the House of Representatives today. Not because it's right, not because it's wrong, but because they're being told how to march by the Republican Tea Party. Very, very quick response before we have another question. Go ahead. As you indicated, I've been involved since 1972. I remember when Republicans had 14 legislators in 1970. Fit all you guys in a phone booth, right? Yeah. Yes. The Democratic leadership did not allow Republican leadership in those days to advance their agenda. Republicans are happy to have Democrats come over and agree with our agenda and get it through. But it's just a fundamental difference of parties that if they have bills that we don't agree with and philosophies that we don't agree with, we don't support those bills. If they have things that we agree with, we do. It's just that simple. Ma'am. I have a question for the Republican chairman. Yeah. Um, with the election coming up, and there's been a lot of discussion about points of view, I want to know why it is that the Republican candidates uh, on statewide ballot are so afraid to have a public conversation and debate with the Democratic candidates and what you have done to encourage or discourage your candidates. Yeah, this is obviously a question of very much of the moment. You know, uh, General Abbott is debating Senator Davis twice. She asked to be, uh, to be on stage with him more than that. Senator Vandepute asked to be on stage with Senator Patrick, I think, five times. Sure. Uh, he said once. From what I can tell, uh, uh, Senator Paxton has not yet agreed to debate Sam Houston. Uh, from what I can tell, Senator Hager has not committed specifically. He's committed more generally to debate Mike Collier. Maybe good for politics, but the question, I think, Ms. Edelman's question is, is good for democracy, to have uh, no, no, no opportunity to hear the two candidates. I'm a real frank person. If you're ahead, you try to debate as few times as possible. And if you're behind, you try to debate as many times as possible. So it's tactics. Of course. In North Carolina, there was just a story yesterday that the Democratic senator doesn't want to debate. Kate Hagan doesn't yeah. want to debate Tom Tillis. Right. right. It's just that's how it is. If, now, it, to me, it's disingenuous to suggest that the only way that voters can get information is from a one-hour uh, debate. People are intelligent. If they want to go to a forum and ask a candidate a question like you just did to us, they can find out what different people believe in. So when you're behind like the Democrats and their ticket is so underfunded and Dan Patrick's ahead of Vanderpute by 15 percentage points and she has no money, you don't want to put the other side on television. It's just that simple. Well, I mean, Mr. Come Chairman, on. come on, the Republican vote. The, the, sorry about that. That's okay. The Republicans had something like 12 or 18 debates during the Republican primary. Um, over and over and over and over again, they debated a bunch of issues that they were coming up and they were trying to see who uh, could out far right wing the other. Uh, look, the, the, everybody in this state that's involved in politics knows that the positions that Dan Patrick has taken on issues that are important to Texans are so far right and so extreme that, um, that, it, that they believe that all Texans need to hear what he really stands for. What has happened 
What has happened is ever since Dan Patrick got nominated by the Republican Party and beat Dewhurst uh, uh, for this position of lieutenant governor, they hit him away. They don't want him to talk to anybody. They don't want him, uh, the public, to know exactly what he stands for because they understand that he doesn't uh, represent what mainstream Texans believe in. His values are so far to the right that uh, they're not something that mainstream, te mainstream Texans can agree with. And so they are not going to, they don't dare put him on a debate with Letizia Vanderpute, which is, defines what Middle Texas is all about, uh, who understands the issues that right. working families go But you understand what, what, what Chairman Ministeri said may not please you, but the reality is if you're ahead in the football game and you can take a knee and run out the clock, you'd do it. But it shouldn't work right? that way. The bottom line, it's like, you know, we talk about trying to pass legislation together. We all agree, we're Americans. We've got soldiers fighting for our freedom in Afghanistan. Before that, we had them fighting in, in, in Iraq. We understand that this military that we fund in this country and they, when we send our soldiers to, to put their lives on the line, they do it for our freedom. And our freedom includes the most important freedom is your right to vote. And so as Americans, we all should believe that we should increase the opportunity for as many Americans to vote as possible. And therefore, if we really wanted to work together to, to do what's right for Texas, we would sit down and pass the strongest legislation that you can have to ensure that more Texans participate in the electoral process as possible. That hasn't happened, and it hasn't happened primarily because the Republicans try to game the system to make sure that only their voters have more of an opportunity to go out and vote than other voters in this in the state. And so what happens in this kind of a situation is, is that they're not trying to work for the best interests of the public. They want to make sure that they win elections no matter what, even if it's uh, adverse to the interests of Tex uh, Americans. I mean, Texans today. Look, the lieutenant governor in the state of Texas is probably, probably the most powerful position today. Texans deserve to hear what Dan Patrick is all about. But and they let, have let not me make a quick point. They are debating. You know, you only, you don't need more than one debate to hear what somebody believes in. Uh, voters, are, I don't think voters are stupid. And we have YouTube. If somebody wants to see a replay of the debate, if they miss it, they can go on. There will be a debate. In the and why did y'all have 18 debates well, or 12 I'll, debates in the lieutenant governor race? Well, you know, you're the chairman of the you party. You can determine any, how many sure. debates they can have. You can say, y'all only need one, and that's it, and you don't have to do it anymore. <laughs> I, I mean, I, come on, I, Steve. Wish, I wish I was that powerful. Uh, but at, at, the, at the RNC level, we did just pass a debate commission, and we are reducing the number of debates from 23 to 8. But that's 8 for 50 states that are having primaries. On behalf of the press, I'd say that we liked all those presidential debates. Those were very enjoyable. Please don't ruin our fun. So good. I yeah. can give you three reasons why they were great, OK? I may have forgot one of them. But... I have an education question for the Republican chairman. Sure. Yes. As an educator, retired. Thank you for that. Texas has cut education greatly. If we do not have education, we're not gonna have anything. When I was in education, we used to say, thank goodness for Mississippi, now we are Mississippi. So what would the Republicans do to help restore this? Because we're never gonna have a state. You've been in control, and now it's bad news. All right, let's let him answer. Sure, I'm happy to answer that. First, let's be intellectually honest. There was never a $5 billion cut from one session to another. There was a $5 billion cut from what people wanted to spend. Most people think a cut is if you spend less than you did the time before. That never happened. In terms of Texas revenue, we actually spent more on Texas revenue on education, even in the session where people say there was a cut. Having said that, to be honest with you, Education was tighter than people wanted to because our economy was down. So you belt tighten. But then last session you come back and you add $3.8 billion. Education is the highest percentage of our state budget of any item. Now I'm, I'm the grandson of, of two grandparents that taught in public schools. My, my girlfriend teaches high school. I think education is the number one priority. But one thing we need to understand Spending money per capita by itself does not mean we are doing a good job. The United States of America spends more money than any other nation in the world per capita, and yet we are not at the top of science. We are not at the top of math. We are way down on the list. 
So money by itself is not the answer. Although, Mr. Chairman, if you look at the TEA's own rankings of schools, ex uh, you know, you have the, 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 the exceptional schools at the very top, you have the acceptable schools in the middle. There is actually a correlation that appears to yeah, be the case no between spending per student, the schools that tend to rank by the TEA's own measurement, spend on average about $1,000 per, per enrolled student more than the schools at the bottom. So you, you, you disagree with the TEA's own findings that there's a correlation well, the, well, between those spent, are, those let two, him answer. Those please. are two different issues yeah. as to whether spending is everything right. and whether there's a correlation. Yeah. Yes, there's correlations, but, but it, it's not just spending. It's, it's not also, only money. Right. Well, and, wait a minute. For I'm, example, in the last session of the legislature, we expanded schools, KIPP Academy, YES Academy, uh, right. They're doing very, very well. So that's that's part of the answer. Well, when you have charter schools, you pull money away from public schools and you decrease the money that's available to be educated. Apparently, the Republican Party is not talking to educators in the state of Texas because if you ask every educator that it, that is that is in there in the classroom trying to teach under the conditions that they face today, they're going to every one of them to a person tell you that more funding will make their job easier and be able to improve their ability to educate our children in Texas. You know, how can you argue that we're where we should be at when we're 49th out of 50 states uh, in the country by in funding per uh, per child uh, uh, it, it, per capita per child in this in the state? That's just fundamentally wrong. And look, that's a great equalizer. That's how we make it in America. That's where we have the opportunity to get out of a difficult life and make a better life for our families. That's what happened to me. I'm a, my mother was a migrant farm worker. I'm the first person to graduate from college in my family. And had I not had a good public education, Mission Texas, I would not be where I'm at today. I give that credit completely to where I'm at. I have a brother that's an architect and a brother that's an engineer. We made it because of the public education system. For us to degrade our public education system and say, well, it's not about funding, it's about other stuff, look at what we're doing for charter schools, ignores the reality that teachers and administrators across the state of Texas and students are facing today. It is wrong. We cannot grow in this state. We cannot pr produce the well-educated, well-trained, critical thinking student that our businesses desperately need in this state unless we adequately fund public education and as importantly unless we give middle class families an opportunity to send their kids to children. Since Rick Perry became governor of Texas, I don't know how much, but it's multiple times, he's multiple numbers, he's increased, increased tuition in this, uh, the tuition has increased for students in, in going to college in this state. They cannot afford to go to college. How do you do, how, if, if, if your tuition cost if your tuition costs per semester are between $4,000 and $6,000 a semester plus books and you're in a middle class family, how do you send your kids to schools? You know, that's why Leticia Vanderpeut proposed, you know, every student that has an opportunity can go to community college for two years. Those are the kind of things that we advocate as Democrats because we think that's good for everybody. If I sit up any farther to try to get you to, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna to end up in your lap, Chairman. Uh, I, I also, I never thought I'd say this, but the Wallace Hall interview was easy than this one. Uh, uh, I want to thank both Chairman uh, Hinojosa, Chairman Ministeri for their generosity in being here today. We're going to have to stop. We're out of time. We'll be posting a video of this interview pretty soon. Thank you both gentlemen. Thank Please you. give them a hand. Good. Thank you very much. Enjoyed it. Thank you. Thank you. Chairman, thank you. Good. All right. We'll see you soon.